So this is Swapnil Bharatiya and today's podcast is about a topic which is uh, really close to my heart because I'm a science fiction writer and I'm also a techno thriller writer in addition to the <laughs> tech journalism that I do. Uh, and technology has always been kind of the foundation of my work, whether it's fiction or reality. But today we are not going to talk about my fiction. We are going to talk about how technology or science is portrayed in the work of fiction these days. I mean, for example, if you look at Mr. Robot, uh, I mean, they, 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 they got it so, so right. I mean, I, okay, l- let me admit that the first episode, uh, they mentioned Katie and... So I see a running no. You know, I'm actually on KDE myself. Actually, I own the K- Google Plus KDE community. So a lot of, you know, KDE fans and all those, they were like super excited about it. And then also, you know, I use Tor, uh, sorry, uh, TaleOS. I, I ro- write about, you know, uh, Kali Linux and everything. So that was, you know, really, really, you know, they, they got it totally right. Uh, so, so, so today, uh, the, the, the big thing is that whatever you see in, in, in TV or movies these days is actually closer to reality, you know, than they appear on the mirror or in your TV screen. So today we're going to talk to uh, James Plough, who, who, who's an expert in this area? So, James, can you please uh, quickly introduce yourself? Sure. My name is James Clough. Uh, I'm a solutions architect at Mobile Iron. So most of my day-to-day is spent actually working with our technology partners to integrate our security and management platform with their security tools. And uh, so I spend a lot of time playing in a, in a big box of technology Legos, I guess, is the best way to put it. Uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, what kind of you know either services or solutions you, do you offer to you know your uh... mobile iron specialty is actually in the security manage uh, security and management of smart devices whether that's your phones tablets even um, you know Windows 10 laptops and tablets that are making their way into the world so that's kind of been our our stock in trade from day one is is letting enterprises securely deploy those devices in their environments. Okay. Uh, one thing that uh, w- when you talk about these days, we are living in the IoT, you know, world. Everything is kind of uh, in that direction. There are so many uh, factors that affect the, the, the security. First of uh, consumer awareness, the Amazon key recent was a good example of uh, that. And before that, last year, I think D-Link was actually fined because uh, of, you know, the way they were kind of uh, doing all the security stuff there. And uh, I think there was another uh, Twy company. I forgot the name. Our our kids used to have those Twys, but we kind of get rid of it. Uh, uh, So they're like consumer awareness plus, you know, the vendors are too lazy. Uh, sometimes their product cycle is like for one week, you know, in Chinese vendors, they just make it, sell it and forget about it. There's no uh, mechanism or incentive for updates. And then third is there is no regulation. So, so how do you deal with these problems? Well, I think that's one of the things that is, is going to be a continual struggle as we see more IOT kind of in our lives, right? Um, there, there's been a long time, standing tradition in industrial design, this notion of planned obsolescence, that a thing lasts for a certain amount of time, and then it just goes away. Um, But we find that uh, a lot of times things last a lot longer than they should. Consumer electronics are a great example. Uh, The issue was that in the good old days, we didn't have things connected to the internet, and so they weren't remotely accessible. And so software bugs were just things that sort of affected uh, maybe the functionality or maybe they weren't even things that you noticed. But, you know, um, as you noted with Amazon Key, a software bug in Amazon Key can be something like a total stranger suddenly having a key to your house and being able to unlock it from a considerable distance away. So uh, uh, one of the things that I think we need to get smarter about is what the real risks are as we sort of approach these things. Um, you know, on the one hand, uh, things like Amazon Echo and Google Home are extremely convenient for kind of having the, the voice assistant. Um, goodness knows we'd all like to have a, a personal assistant nearby to help us out with the little things, right? I, I have one right now you can see. 
<laughs> on my table. <laughs> exactly. And uh, uh, but the caveat is then that it's also um, a live microphone that's sort of sitting in your home. And I, I don't want to be too much of a tinfoil hat character about it, but um, it, it's unclear how those things will sort of uh, integrate themselves into our lives over time and what that'll mean as we continue to use them. We're always um, a lot better about figuring out a nifty thing to do than we are about figuring out the long-term implications of those nifty things. Yes. I was actually, I was working on an IIT story and uh, when we were going to buy our refrigerator because we just bought a house two years ago and uh, a smart fridge and I was curious that the lifespan of an average fridge is like 12 years or whatever it is, you know, maybe more. Uh, but when I checked with Samsung or LG about, okay, for how, what is their policy for software update on those refrigerators? For example, let's say two years later, if Samsung stops updating the firmware or, you know, updating the software or Tizen or whatever is running on the fridge, it, it, it's not that, you know, that somebody is going to dry my Coke from my fridge. The problem is that it's connected to the network and that will compromise my whole network and then it will get access to everything else in the house. And they never came back with a concrete answer. So, so as you said, you know, that some devices are designed, but there are a lot many other devices that are de designed to last that long. But if you go to their warranty page or support page, it's nowhere it mentions that you will get software till 10 years or 20 years. No, nothing. So, so, so I was like, okay, somebody just like Mr. Robot, somebody can hack into your fridge and turn it off like for five hours every night. So your meat is all rotten. So when you have a party, everybody will get food poisoning or salmonella or whatever that will die you know so you don't have so 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 uh, that brings me to the fictional part of it that uh, when we think about i i recall the early days of science fiction it, it used to be like you know that a science fiction writer kind of challenges the technology you know that okay what else you can do you know now uh, 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 like look at arthur c clark he, he gave the idea of satellites you know and you, nobody could patent satellite because he was so precise about it the, the fall on the moon does he wrote about what kind of you know uh, environment will be there on the moon and they, that it came out to be true but nowadays what is happening is that as a science fiction writer we are living in that day. I mean we are talking you know we used to talk about video phone and stuff like that we are actually sitting real life time and recording it and so now the challenge for, uh, technology is posing to the writers is that what else can you think you know <laughs> so yeah it's and I think you see an interesting trend in that regard. Um, both in uh, popular culture, some of the things you see depicted in things like Mr. Robot, but also series like Black Mirror, where mm -hmm. um, as we start to have all of this ubiquitous technology, I think it is counseling us to view it with a little bit more skepticism than we have historically. Um, you know, it's, it's really great. You and I are talking to each other. I'm in Michigan. You're in Virginia. Um, and and this is fantastic. Like when I saw the first commercial, and I'm going to date myself here, I suppose, with technology, but the first commercial where AT&T was advertising video conferencing, it was like you would have to go to a special phone booth that AT&T had somewhere and step inside. And, and it was on a screen, you know, that was like eight inches diagonal and the picture quality was terrible. But you and I can see each other in, in high def. We're doing that from the, the comfort of our offices. Um, and it, it works out extremely well. Um, but, you know, it is one of those things that um, while there are certain conveniences, as one of my favorite singer songwriters says, every tool is a weapon if you hold it right. And so it is incumbent upon us to, to exercise a little bit of caution, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> You touched upon Mirror and uh, uh, and uh, you know, Mr. Robot. I mean, uh, it depends on the, the audience, you know. Uh, most of us do know that uh, when he's SSHing into something, you know, you know, or they're using TailOS or Kali Linux, we do know why they're, one is penetration tool, you know, when you talk about security, doesn't mean, you know, that, oh, if you put TailOS, that is, so, so there are different tools for different things. Uh, when, when, when she was hacking into whether it's FBI system, FBI system or when they took control of the whole house, you know, uh, uh, and mm -hmm. how, how real are, are those threats actually? You know, how much of that is fiction versus how much of that is real? 
Well, I think, you know, the reality is that um, at the end of the day, these things are, are meant to tell a story. And so you have the luxury of, of keeping things grounded in reality, but also taking a little bit of dramatic license in the service of the story. But I think the, the case of hacking the smart house is a great example, and I, I know you'll appreciate this based on your background, but a lot of what's made this innovation possible is open source software. Um, you know, we don't have to code everything from scratch anymore. We can find the components in the libraries we need and assemble them in the way that lets us do the things that we want. And so that, that has been a key driver for a lot of what we've seen in things like smart homes, the fact that Linux exists and there's a lot of open source hardware designs for for different things that you might want to do. Um, the downside there is that when you're using open source software, and if you don't have any plan for what the life cycle of that software will be, as you found with your, your questions about the refrigerator, right? Um, what will you do when a vulnerability is discovered? Because secure today is not the same thing as secure tomorrow. And so, you know, you may roll out something, you may have done all of the requisite testing on the software, you may not have found any vulnerabilities, but down the road, something may occur. And so, um, well, I think there's, there's an element of fiction. There's also, a, while, while the example in Mr. Robot of, smack, of hacking a smart home is, is somewhat fictitious, it's not that far removed from real scenarios. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, open source uh, since I have been covering open source and you know you see you know open source you know you, I don't know if you can see it it's all 3D printed on open source printer actually uh, and uh, I have I, been covering and I, yeah please go ahead oh I was just going to say I, I noticed the master sword there in the background which uh, is very near and dear to my own heart having been playing Legend of Zelda games for I guess close to 30 years at this point <laughs> yeah it, uh, this is getting a bit off topic, but the thing is, I'm actually playing the the Master Sword trial, and I'm uh, still on the first first layer of the three level, and I always die at then, so I am kind of getting upset. But I will try to finish it because you know you'll get from thirty power, you'll get all the with the sixty. <laughs> so yeah, yeah but the, and I, then that you did may not have seen this, but this is Sawtooth from Zero Dawn Horizon. Horizon oh, Dawn nice. Zero. Yeah, so this is also 3D printed on the, and all of these are uh, fully open source 3D printers. The point that I mentioned it, because I'm into gaming, but I don't play games, but but I'm, I I like, I have PlayStation, I have uh, Xbox, I have Nintendo Switch. I, I like to keep myself platform agnostic, so I don't become a fanboy of certain technology. And I also, you know, see where it's going now. Uh, so when you mentioned open source, um, I mean, if you look at the proprietary word, uh, it's not that proprietary word is secure, you know, only they have access to the source code and you cannot even do reverse, you know, in most cases because it could be illegal or DMCA is there now for, uh, with open source, the, the thing is that anyone can look at it and uh, anyone can fix it. That's what happens, you know, when you look at the Linux kernel mailing list, you know, Red Hat doesn't have to patch it, Suze can patch it, anyone, you can patch it, I can patch it, send it to Linux store where else he will take a patch or not take a patch. Proprietary, you cannot do that. But the problem is that uh, these, you know, companies, vendors, without naming anybody, they put binaries on it, but they don't offer any mechanism for even a user who want to change to upload the firmware. So, so, uh, uh, and so should not there be uh, a way, I mean, like, for example, I can very easily hack my router and, you know, put the open source, you know, uh, firmware on it and uh, improve the performance. So should there be uh, either through regulation that, you know, uh, first of all, uh, it should be mandatory to up keep the firmware upgrade till the life cycle of the product itself. You, you tell, you know, what is the life cycle of the product. Second is that it should be, the user should be allowed to upgrade the firmware and since you are using open source libraries and stuff already you can offer you know that as on github so users you know whoever want they can you know take over their fridge when you plan to and support for it just the way you know of my laptop i can put linux on it and run whatever what do you think about that I mean, uh, what I'm trying to say is that being an op uh, based on open source, there is a great advantage that they don't have to really have that liability and burden, you know, they can just say, yeah, go ahead, you know, you can, what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think we haven't really seen co companies embrace that to date. 
Um, and you've seen kind of that sort of argument go down actually with um, John Deere. So you have farmers out um, who are very much accustomed to maintaining their own tractors, but now their tractors rely heavily on software. And so they've actually been going out to the internet and getting cracked versions of firmware to update their tractors, you know, in much the same way that they would, would repair the engine uh, once upon a time. And so I think there is an interesting discussion that needs to be had and, and some consensus needs to be reached between companies and customers about what constitutes ownership. Because in mm -hmm. a lot of respects, um, you know, we find ourselves at, at the receiving end of a fairly lengthy and complex legal agreement when you unbox any given new device, when you take a, mm -hmm. an iPhone out of the box or a new Google Pixel, you know, one of the things that you're doing is accepting a lot of terms and conditions about how the software will work and how mm -hmm. the software will work affects the useful lifespan of the device. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's an area that from a consumer point of view requires a little more focus and and attention. Um, I always get a little bit cagey thinking about regulation because you always worry that regulation will potentially stifle innovation. That's certainly not what we're about. But by the same token, um, to your point, that what if I want to continue to safely use the device that I've acquired, whatever that device is, whether it's my John Deere tractor or or uh, my tablet? Um, with everything so connected all the time, we have to really think about what the life cycle means, and, and we have to start reevaluating how we approach these things. Uh, it, it frankly just doesn't make sense to say that when there are no more, more software updates, the hardware should automatically go in the landfill. That's just uh, no kind of way to use resources. Right. I mean, the, the whole point is that uh, it enables you to keep, you know, that device alive. And when you mentioned John Deere, it's, it's, it's actually, uh, even legally, there is no such thing which stops, but uh, John Deere or other companies, they are using DMC article 1201, which is more about copyright, you know, so they are saying simply, since my code runs on it, so I have, so you are, they're abusing copyright laws, to gain ownership of the, the so so that article should be totally you know abolished altogether and you know uh, and it should be allowed for for uh, for researchers or users to be able to do what they want to do with the machine that they have purchased so i think that is a lot of political thing also needs to be done uh, but coming back to the point of all the risks that are there you know we cannot even kind of uh, I, I, even as a fiction writer, you know, I can only think so much, you know, what is possible. There are a lot of possibilities uh, where things can go wrong. So what, what, what should people do to protect themselves? Because, uh, I, like, as I said, I have this Google, two Google Home devices. I don't use uh, uh, Amazon Echo very much because I can have a very natural conversation with Google Home. I can let's say hey what kind of food they eat in belgium you know it will tell it they eat you know waffles and fries because i lived in belgium so i know and then i don't even have to tell it i'd say i'll say you know what is the capital you know oh, sorry where is it so it will tell me brussels so it knows the context i can just keep talking what kind of food they eat what kind of clothes they wear how to go there it knows that i'm talking about belgian and brussels with siri i won't even even talk about siri's iq is as good as a dog's iq uh, Amazon Echo is, is really, you know, not good at answering these kind of, actually, even when I ask, you know, because I just got a Panasonic GH5, if I ask Alexa, uh, how good is GH5S? I don't know. Do you want me to order a GH5? That's what will be the answer. If I asked Google Home, it will read something from a site. It will tell according to GeekWire or, you know, um, GR Review, blah, blah. This is what the device is all about. So these are smart devices, they have access to everything. And the problem is that we don't own these devices. We, 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 we have this hardware in our home, but Google, Amazon or Apple, in case of Apple may be different because Siri runs, I don't think it runs too much on the cloud, but you know, we, we, these companies own these devices. We have no control over what kind of data they are accessing. We don't know because they are listening all the time. We just take their words, you know, that, okay, you said it's not listening. That means it's not listening, you know, but it, so how do people protect themselves 
while taking advantage of these devices because I don't want to live in a cage either, cave either, you know. I don't want to go back, crawl back, you know, uh, to ocean. Uh, so how do we maintain this balance between, uh, you know, accessing these technologies while protecting ourselves? Yeah, I think there's going to have to be at least a certain amount of work done on the political front, you know, just to have some sort of advocacy. Um, you know, we saw this kind of happen a while back with website privacy policies that for a long, long time, people were, the way that people were tracked on websites wasn't necessarily immediately obvious to folks. Um, and there was a big, big push from consumers to understand how am I being tracked? How do you use the data once I'm at your site? Um, and the language around those privacy policies got clearer. Um, and I think that's actually going to become, at some point for companies, a competitive differentiator, right? That we can tell you in very plain language exactly what it is we do, how we handle the data, how we keep it safe, what we use it for, where we store it, these sorts of things. A lot of that right now is actually, unfortunately, very opaque. And so it would be hard for, for an end user to make an informed decision about would I rather have a Google Home or an Amazon Alexa in in my house um, based on the sort of privacy policies there? And so I think, you know, at some point that it is going to be a, an issue um, just from a, a consumer protection point of view. But I think um, forward looking companies will use that to your advantage or their advantage rather. And you've seen that a little bit, I think, from Apple right now, that they actually quite, they, you know, as a subtext to a lot of their messaging, um, really, really focus on the privacy piece of it. And, and that has implications for a lot of other stuff as well, uh, in, including, you know, law enforcement. And so I think there's going to be a lot of healthy and vigorous debate for a long, long time, but it is something that, that, the consumer community needs to start pushing for. I mean, it, it, it was the same thing with going back for technology for a long, long time, whether you're talking about seat belts or airbags, um, it needs to be uh, the, the sort of thing that, that consumers demand and that companies are able to drive value from providing that level of transparency, I think. Uh, that makes perfect sense, but here's the irony that uh, U.S. is one of those countries where Facebook is one of the most popular networks. So when you're logged into Facebook and regularly feeding them with everything that is going on in your life, I don't think you will be very conscious about privacy and demand, you know, some other vendor, hey, don't access. So I have a lot of, I lived in Europe, so I have a lot of friend, European friends and I work with a lot of European countries and they, companies, and they have very strict policies when it comes to privacy, you know, rights. And they are really, really very, very, you know, particular about, uh, about this thing. Like I work with a company called Nextcloud and they offer, you know, Dropbox like solution, but you have total, con you can run it, you know, server, you can control who can access it or not. And, uh, and, and that's amazing because, you know, I run that, you know, on my own server, you can rent services from other people. So, so here, when we look at, you know, that people are logged into their Facebook all the time, they are sharing their stories on Instagram. Do you really think that there will be a, a, a you know, a, a consumer awareness at all? Because, you know, companies will look at Facebook, they'll say, okay, we will not do any policies. We will route you through Facebook. So if you want to join our service, you know, log into your Facebook account. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's one of those things that that we wish we would get that awareness kind of overnight, right? Um, mm -hmm. that, that building up that that kind of muscle memory about the the way to keep yourself safe online um, just came naturally to us. But all of this technology is very new. And so we have to to muddle through, I think, as we we work some of this out. Um, and, and that does make it difficult, though. Uh, thankfully, we do have plenty of science fiction as kind of a, a little bit of a compass for navigating some of those those thornier issues. Um, but it is something that that we we have to stop and, and be able to think critically about. Um, you know, we're very quick to latch on to convenience, but we don't always think about what we're giving up in exchange. Um, just uh, like 
for myself, I, I started thinking about how I used Facebook and I actually dropped off Facebook um, maybe six years ago or so mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I, I decided that while it let me keep in touch with people in a, in a really convenient way that if what I really wanted was to stay in touch with those people, I should reach out to them directly as opposed to sort of letting this cloud service become a proxy for my personal interactions with the people that I cared about. And mm -hmm. so um, that makes certain things trickier because everybody, you know, lives in different places, has different schedules and has different stuff going on in life. But um, that was just sort of the personal decision that I made in terms of how am I going to stay connected to the people that I want to stay connected to and not use this tool. Um, so it made me change my behaviors a little bit, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't think I'm, I'm too much worse off for it. I mean, there are definitely things that I know that I miss out on by not participating in Facebook, but by the same token, I feel like, you know, um, the things I've traded have made other stuff more meaningful. And if we sit down and think about those things, um, you know, everybody's going to make a different decision, but it's something we should all consider for ourselves and what that means for our, our use of technology. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I, re I remember Richard M. Stallman, uh, he's the founder of Free Software Foundation and the GNU GPL, which is the most popular license used in Linux. And he's not on Facebook and, you know, he has visited our, us, he has stayed with us and he's really, 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 you know, he, he says that, so I would like to you know my friends are there on Facebook uh, so I have to stay in touch. He said, just because your friends are going to jump off the cliff doesn't mean you should jump off the cliff too. They can go to hell. I don't care. But you don't go there. Uh, so you're, you, I mean, that's, but that's not the ideal solution when they have like one billion solutions. So you're right in both ways. First of all, either, you know, disconnect them yourself or uh, become an agent to change people's behavior. Because if there's enough pressure, you know, Facebook and all those companies, you know, they will have to change uh, but there's no push so there's no push so there's nothing happening now uh, uh can you just highlight some of the key uh immediate risk that people who uh, either use iot devices or you know any of these devices smart devices what are the few you know like five check box they should keep in mind so that we can say that okay if you do these things that james is recommend you will be relatively safer than you were earlier well i think um IoT devices are particularly tricky because many of them are so new and so many of them it's, it's unclear what, um, you know, what exactly is running inside. So you don't, you don't really know what's going on with IoT devices all the time. So my gen general advice for IoT is um, think about what your IoT device does for you and try to imagine the nightmare scenario that you have, like if a hacker was able to take total control of that thing, and it, it seems a little sensational to put it that way, but if a hacker was able to take total control of that device, how uncomfortable would your life become? And if the answer is extremely, then maybe an IoT device isn't the right choice for you. I, weird as this seems, I have an analog thermostat in my house. Um, you know, not because I'm particularly afraid of IoT thermostats, just that uh, the analog thermostat does the job for me just fine. Um, mm -hmm. And at some point I'm gonna need to replace it and I'll probably go digital and I probably will get an IoT enabled, but I don't have a need to do that right now. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, people harp on, on this specific thing in any security context and it always seems a little, uh, you know, a, a little repetitive, but for your smart devices, stay on top of those software updates. Um, for the most part, the, the OS manufacturers out there have done a really great job of trying to stay on top of security issues. Um, and it's, you know, it's a lot more convenient to update your uh, iPhone or your Google Pixel than it has ever been to like, if you set the Wayback Machine, even just to Windows XP, right? You can remember like doing the right. service pack and it bricking your computer. Um, one, these updates are a lot faster. They're a lot more frequent. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, that's probably as obvious as it seems. And as many people say it, it, it is really surprising the number of folks who, 
don't think about software updates as being sort of critical to their internet safety. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, use caution when procuring new software. So again, kind of looking at the curated app stores, uh, whether you're talking about Apple's app store or Google play, they're not panaceas for perfect software. Um, bad software does sometimes get in there, but the good news is it doesn't get in there very often. And when it does, it gets cleaned up very quickly. Um, I know a lot of folks who grab Android apps from very suspicious sources and, um, you know, as, uh, as dicey as an analogy as this might be, I would say, think back to some of the things you learned in middle school biology about health and well-being and try to apply some of those same concepts to the way that you deal with your, your uh, digital life as well. And I think you'll, you'll be better off. Uh, yeah, before we wrap it up, there are two or, two or three points you mentioned that are really important. Uh, I was reading a story a few days ago, I think it was in Verge, where the, the author complained that he was listening a song and suddenly there was an update on Alexa. So Alexa stopped the song and installed the updates. I don't think it, it this kind of practice should be criticized. It could have been a very, you know, serious so uh, security update, which meant that it has to be updated. So your listening to song is not that important as it is for, you know, zero day vulnerability to be fixed immediately. So you should be appreciating that, you know, it was fixed, number one. Number two is that, as you mentioned for the App Store, yes, please don't buy. But at the same time, when you go to Amazon.com or eBay, don't look for the cheapest device, you know, if the device is accessing your network, I mean, that should be, you know, the first thing that you should always look at really credible, uh, is you know uh, uh, manufacturers or so don't just buy you know those inexpensive knockoff Chinese cameras you know to monitor your babies or for security or whatever it is, you spend some more money, but at least you will get a company which will have a warranty and there you will know that okay you're 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 you know because as you said earlier also that when you get an IT device and and if a hacker you know accesses it will you be buried? I think most people even don't know that. Uh, if a hacker accesses the device, what can go wrong? They say, oh, okay, they access my thermostat. Okay, they may increase the temperature. No, once they are in your network, they can use you as a, you know, as a, as, as a botnet for DDoS attack themselves. You know, they can access, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and if you're using an you know, insecure browser or non https sites, they can steal your credit card information from your browser. I mean, they can do anything that they want once they are in your network. So yeah, be very, very careful <laughs> when you are buying any of these devices. Uh, any other uh, any other closing, you know, uh, thoughts before we wrap this up? Um, I, you know, I think I'm good on my end. I certainly appreciate you uh, offering up the opportunity to chat with you. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, same here. And hopefully we'll, you know, see each other again and we'll talk about, you know, more IT related or, you know, other, you know, mobile related, security related stuff. And, you know, thanks a lot for your time and bye for today. My pleasure. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.